Y'all, we're going to have fun today. I mentioned her in the prayer. 30 people got baptized last week right here in this spot. There's was a lot to celebrate. It's Pumpkin Spice Day. God's moving. Our first service opened a few weeks ago. There's so much to celebrate. Uh, before we continue, I want to welcome everyone who's new in the house and online, especially our military community. Would you give it up for everyone who's deployed and watching online? Would you say hello to our military in the house and everyone who's new? If you are new around here, in the house or online, we'd love it. If However you're watching or enjoying this, please subscribe. Uh, we want to make it easy to stay connected. And if you are new around here, please connect with us on social media. You can find us on Instagram in particular at Ascent Church VA. Hit follow. We want to make it easy to, to, to stay connected. Now, we're having fun today, but we're going to talk about a serious topic, right? And, and I wanted like fun pumpkin spice day to help boost the spirits a little bit because we're talking about something heavy. This series is called Divine Questions. And it's questions that, not that we have for God, but questions that God has for us. And today we're going to study the life of Elijah. We're going to look at this through the lens of mental health. Because if you are a person, you struggle at some point with mental health. If you've watched the news or if you have any friends, you know that this is something our society is really grappling with. This is 1 Kings 19. We're going to start verses 1 and 2. This is a lot, but I'm going to break it down. It says, now Ahab, the king, told Jezebel, the queen... Everything Elijah the prophet had done. And now he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah the prophet to say this. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. What's happening? Let's pray and then we'll begin. Father God, your word sometimes, um, it, it, it goes over our heads. Help us understand. Help us grasp it. Help it uh, meet us exactly where we are. I ask you to challenge us, to cut us deep, help us grow um, today in this place. We love you, we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Let me break down what's going on in the life of Elijah. Elijah was, for lack of a better term, a savage. Dude was the man. He was that guy, okay? And he was a prophet in a time where the king Ahab and the queen Jezebel had turned away from worshiping God, and they were worshiping this guy, this fake god called Baal, who's a god of fertility and life. And they were worshiping Baal. And not only the king and queen, but it seemed like the whole nation had turned away. Now, Elijah, as a prophet, his job was to call the people to repent and turn back to God. So that's what he tries to do. And he does this thing that has never been seen before in Scripture. He challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest. He says, meet me on the mountain, and we're going at it, y'all. My God versus your God. We're going to set up two altars. And they did. They said, okay. They, they said, and the prophets of Baal all morning, they're chanting and yelling and screaming. And, and, and they're trying to get fire to come down. And no fire comes down. And Elijah, the savage, is talking smack. We got any good trash talkers in the house? Now, you won't see it in church. But some of y'all, I can tell by looking at you, you know how to. Elijah may have been the original trash talker. He's making fun of their God. He's confident. He, he's running his mouth. He's not phased at all. And it seems, it's just him. It's him versus all these prophets. And now it's Elijah's turn. And in the middle of a drought, mind you, he dumps water on his altar to make it even harder, to make sure everyone knows that God is going to do this. And he prays. And it's not some magical secret prayer. It's not some long. It's short. It's short, but he prays. And fire comes down on his altar. And this was Elijah's plan all along. And he, he's like, they, 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 finally, people will see. People will understand that the Lord, he is God, and they'll turn away from the false gods, and they'll worship the true God. And, and what they did was, this is a little savage too, and I just kind of mentioned it, but they went down to the valley, they took all the prophets of Baal, and they, they executed them. That's what they did in those days if someone was a false prophet. So Elijah just called down fire from heaven, right? He's on cloud nine, man. His enemies are vanquished. You know that he's got to be fired up. Now what he does now, the commentators will tell us, he went to the capital. He went to the capital because Elijah had to be thinking, I've done it. I've done it. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, people have got to know that the Lord is God. There's no false God. Fire came down from heaven, by the way. And the king and the queen, they will have to repent. They'll have to turn back. The nation will be saved. The nation will be made whole again. But when he gets there, that passage I just read is what happened to him. The king and queen did not repent. The queen basically says, you killed my prophets, I'm killing you. The queen basically said, man, I drop dead if by this time tomorrow you are still alive. If you're not dead, may I drop dead. This is, this is not what he's expecting. 
Now, what you know based on Elijah's life, the savage, the hitter, you know what you think he'd say? I got some fire for you too, honey. That's what you'd expect. And if you're reading the narrative, you're like, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? What's he got up his sleeve? 1 Kings 19, 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Is that junk right? Did y'all post this properly? It doesn't sound right. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Now, some commentators have said that this is a compiling of two stories because no one at the top of their spiritual and Uh, And career-wise, game would act like this. And that just shows that we do not understand mental health. Look at me. We are as vulnerable at the top as we are at the bottom. And often you'll see a celebrity. Or maybe a, 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 a famous pastor. Or a famous musician, and you look at them, and from the outside, they seem to have it all. They're successful, they, they have, they're wealthy, they have a family, they have success, they're at the top of their game. And something will happen to their mental health, and we will say, why would anything happen to them? They have it all. That shows you don't understand mental health. Some of you ladies in this, house, in this room today, I, I guarantee you, you have had a baby. And you've always wanted a baby, but when you finally held that baby, it didn't feel like you thought it would feel. And maybe you were depressed, maybe you were anxious, maybe you felt guilty about that. And maybe you were afraid to vocalize that to anyone because you have some friends who would say, how could you not be on cloud nine? This should be the happiest time of your life. That shows we don't understand mental health. Some of you maybe are getting back from from deployment or have come back from a deployment. Maybe it was combat, maybe it wasn't, but maybe it's becoming hard to adjust back to life as normal. Maybe it's hard. Maybe there's some anxiety. Maybe there's some lingering thoughts or depression or some fear or some hesitations. Maybe it's just hard to connect with your spouse again. And maybe you're hesitant to vocalize that because someone would say, you did it. Mission accomplished. Everything should be fine. What do you mean you're depressed? What do you mean things are hard? This shows we do not understand mental health. We are as vulnerable at the top as you are at the bottom. And I believe God gives us this little case study on mental health to show us that if it can happen to Elijah... The one who calls down fire from heaven. And then it can, happen to, it can happen to you and to me as well. And we've talked about veteran uh, and, and active duty mental health a lot. Um, and what you need to know is it's getting worse. Not only in the military but beyond. And uh, I want to talk about the S word for a minute. I'm, I, I joke a lot. I'm not trying to be funny. I know I'm a guy who just threw out pumpkin treats to you. I'm not trying to be funny. If I say the S word... YouTube will throttle this message down. It might even block it or remove it. And I want to talk to you about the S word. And our heart here is that if this message will help you or help someone else, that you'll share it with them on the podcast or YouTube. But if I say the S word, they'll throttle it down. But I'm going to give you some quick stats on the S word. S, I think you know what I'm talking about. S rates increased approximately 36% between 2000 and 2021. S, the S word, was responsible for 48,183 deaths in 2021, which is about one death every 11 minutes. Now, behind you, if you look, you can look. There's a little countdown clock. I got 30 minutes. I'm a preacher, so I'm going to go over. Okay, it could be 33, it could be 35 minutes. But what I want you to know is by the time the sermon is over, three people would have taken their lives. Three people have. Every 11 minutes. Every 11 minutes. Now, Elijah doesn't do that, but you could tell he does not want to be alive. Now, what's going on here? We've got to break this down. The first thing he did was withdraw. First thing he did was withdraw. When he had this plan, and it was actually working. Fire came down from heaven, and he said, this has got to work. It's got to come to pass. The people have to repent. They did not repent. They didn't turn back. And the first thing he did when his life wasn't going as he thought it would go, he's in despair. He's depressed. He's done. The first thing he did was withdraw. The first thing I do when things aren't, when I'm in a bad spot is I withdraw. We withdraw. And if we can be honest with ourselves, Elijah did it, you and I did it. When things aren't going well, especially with our mental health, we withdraw. Think about the Dallas Cowboy fans for a second. Because you heard him. It's my year. It's our year. We're going 
we're, we're talking loud on Saturday. We got our jerseys on. You got your hats, your stuff. But after Sunday afternoon, what do they do? They withdraw. <laughs> the posts stopped coming after that. After they got beat down last week. I don't even got time to talk about that. I'm going to talk to everyone, but especially to the men. There's a mental health epidemic. There's also a loneliness epidemic, and they are connected. You can be surrounded by people and be utterly alone. I want you to know that. The USO quotes a 2018 study. It said that social connections can act as a buffer against the impact of stressful or negative life experiences on mental health. What we say here all the time is community is not found. Community is built. It's built. Don't come here for a concert. Come here for community. Don't come and say, oh, I, like the, I like the music. I like the, the, the sermon encouraged me. I'm good. That, that's fine, but life change is going to happen more often in circles than in rows. You need a small group. You need people talking to you who are actually like people you can't lie to. You know what I'm talking? You got people. How are you doing? Fine. They're like, you're lying. How would you know? They know. You need people like that in your life. I just want you to know there is help out there. This can be a place. If you're not even sure what you think about God, if you're questioning this, that, maybe you just moved here, maybe you don't know anyone, you can call this your home. You can be a part of this community because the temptation is to withdraw. I want to thank everyone here who gives faithfully and sacrificially, who tithes, because what you need to understand is we send a lot of people to counseling here. Either our staff does it or we work with other counseling networks. And if you need that, please let us know. We'll do our absolute best to pay for it for you. That's something we believe in. If it's counseling, if it's a friend, if it's a group, do not go through this thing alone. It says, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. Sometimes what you need is carbs and a nap. A boy of mine's about to get back from deployment. And you know what we talk about all the time? We're going to get, we're going to do weights and a waffle. A pump and a pancake. You feel me? Right now, 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 I, I need to look. I have a master's degree in this. You think I would know. At, usually when an angel shows up, you know what an angel says? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I don't know if this is the only time. It's got to be one of the few times the angel does not say do not be afraid. The angel says, what kind of pancakes you want? Got blueberry, got chocolate chip, got pumpkin spice, you know, it's that time of year. Don't miss the wisdom and mercy and grace of our God. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. And we can't go through life putting like spirituality on one side and then like emotional stuff here and relationship stuff here and physical stuff here. It's all connected. It is so connected. And the first thing Elijah needed was not a sermon. It was not a rebuke. It was not a new perspective. It wasn't even a small group. It was a nap and some pancakes. It was a nap and some pancakes. Point one, if you're taking notes, is this. Trust is provision. One of my favorite books called Essentialism, it says this. Once we get below seven hours of sleep, we can measure impairments on the brain. The book talks about a phenomenal athlete, Katrin. David's daughter. I don't think I'm saying her name properly. But in 2014, she was inches away from reaching the world championship, and she stalled. She broke down. She couldn't do it. She hired a new coach, Ben Bergeron, and Ben Bergeron is talking with the author of Essentialism, and the author of Essentialism says this. When I spoke with Bergeron on my podcast, I asked him about that 2014 competition. He told me that if in that stalled moment, if she had taken even one minute to rest physically and reset mentally before resuming, she would have finished the climb and made it into the finals. He says this, her entire life became about five things, training, recovery, nutrition, sleep, and mindset. That year, how'd she do? In 2015, she became the champion. Fittest woman on earth. 2016, she did it again. And at the time of this book, she finished in the top five every year for the past five years. What is God calling you to do where the lack of rest is slowing you down? Where the lack of saying, I need a minute, I need a break, I need to take five minutes. Because sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. 
Where are my introverts at? We got any introverts in the house? For the introverts, the best part of making plans is canceling plans. Okay? I'm going to give you permission. You said, Pastor T told me to. Sometimes you need to go and be social, but sometimes you know darn well. You need to stay. You need to just put on a blankie and just sit. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. Skip the party. Lay down. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. The journey is too much for you. Hold on to that. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went to a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. This is the question for the day. You thought I forgot. There's a question every single week in this series. It's a question that God asks us and he asks Elijah and I think he's asking us. The word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? For someone with a burden... For someone with anxiety or depression or struggling with their mental health, I'm going to ask you, what are you doing here? What got you here? What has happened in your life that has got you to this place? What are you doing here, mom? What are you doing here, dad? What are you doing here, husband? What are you doing here, wife? What are you doing here, sailor? What are you doing here, team guy? What are you doing here, stay-at-home mom? What are you doing here, young professional? What are you doing here? What are you doing here, student? And I've heard jokes about this, and God isn't saying, what what are you doing here? (laughs) Elijah, you look awful. What are you doing? No, no, he's not being sarcastic. He's not being witty. God knows. God knows. But he's he's asking a question. I think Elijah needs to ask himself, what am I doing here? What got me to this place? What has got me here? Because we got to know what got us here before we get up out of here. Finally, we hear Elijah speak, verse 10. Because we've seen his actions. We've seen he's depressed. We've seen he wishes he were not alive. We see he's just depleted. But finally he gets to speak. So we get to see into his brain a little bit. He replied this. What am I doing here? Here's what. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. I mean, I've been working my butt off. I've been working hard. I've been doing it all. I'm a person of passion. I've been sacrificing, risking. I've been going all in. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. Torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. There's a lot here. Part of this is I had this perfect plan. I thought you were behind it. It didn't work. And some of y'all are feeling that. I thought I'd be married by now. I thought I would have got that promotion by now. I thought I'd be finally be healthy by now. Part of this conversation is that it's all on him. Do you feel the burden? It's all on him. Everyone's dead but me. It's all on me. I'm the only one left. They're trying to kill me too. Of course I had to run. This parenting thing, it's all on me. Raising my kids right, it's all on me. Providing for my family, it's all on me. It's all on me. It's no one else. Look how God responds. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face. And he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now we're running short on time. Verse 14 repeats, what am I doing here? He says the same speech. Same speech as he said before, the same thing, word for word. And I think, I think for those, that whole run, he muttered it to himself. He said it over and over and over. And as, I want to ask you, is there something you're muttering to yourself? I've done everything right. This shouldn't happen to me. I'm in church every week. I can't believe God would do this. I've tried so hard. Why, why is my plan not going as I expected? He's got this stuff Memorized. Are you walking around carrying that burden, that message to yourself? It's all on me. It's all on me. It's all on me. Look, look, verse 15, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Now, when you get there, anyone has a king over Aram. 
Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Haziel, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the word of Jehu. Point two is this. Trust his plan. This, I would argue, is the clearest portrayal of God's plan that we get anywhere in Scripture. It's almost like God is saying, what makes you think I don't have a plan? What makes you think I'm not aware of your situation? What makes you think that I'm going to leave you hanging? What makes you think I'm not going to be there for your marriage and for your health and for your future? Because I wanted someone to know God is already working on whatever you're worrying about. God's like, I got the people lined up. I got the plan. I want you to annoy this person as a prophet. That person is a king. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. He even gives them directions. Go back the way you came. Take this path. Find this person. Do this. Now, there's something here that's subtle, but I think it changed his life. It talked about who was going to succeed him as a prophet. Did you catch that? Elisha will succeed you as a prophet. There's some subtle beauty in that. And God's maybe reminder to Elijah that you're not going to always have to do this. It's not always going to be on you. There's this subtle of like, there's this burden. This is hard. It's hard being a mom. It's hard being a dad. It's hard being a husband. It's hard being a wife. It's hard being a student. It's hard carrying this. And there's a subtle, loving reminder. It won't always be this way. I think one of Elijah's problems is that he feels like this is it. It's going to be like this forever. God not only shows him he has a plan, but he reminds him of his provision. Verse 18, look, he says, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Elijah's biggest mistake is he thought it was all on him. Did you catch that? I'm the only one left. God lovingly said, I'm the only, he, Elijah's like, I'm the only one left. God's like, y'all, I got 7,000 left. Do you feel the burdens coming off, Elijah? Knowing it's not all on him? That God is working through this, that God has a purpose and a plan behind the scenes. One of the biggest things I hear that I think is intended to be an encouragement, I think actually puts a lot of people in a pit. And it's this phrase, God won't give you anything you can't handle. Someone will be going through a season, they'll be like, well, God won't give you anything you can't handle. What does that mean? Because usually when you say it to someone, they're not handling it too well. Are you saying God didn't give this to me? Are you saying that I can handle it, but I shouldn't? Like, what, what, what does it actually mean? God won't give you anything you can't handle. If I can read back what was said to Elijah while he was resting, it said, the, I'm going to look right in the camera and say it, the journey is too much for you. That mental health battle you're fighting by yourself, the journey's too much for you. That deployment you're trying to get through solo, the journey is too much for you. That season that you're walking through, trying to rely on your, on your own strength, the journey is too much for you. But I've got some good news for everyone in the house. The journey is too much for you, but the journey is not too much for him. It's not too much for him. And I think this was Elijah's number one problem. And, and God just addresses it right on. He said, it's all on me. Some of us in this room, you're trying to get through life without community. You're trying to get through this battle without counseling. You're trying to get it through it without scripture, without the Holy Spirit. You're saying, I am strong enough. I don't need anybody else. Elijah, that guy, the savage, the man who in his mind single-handedly took on the, all the prophets of Baal on the mountain, it was too much for him. And it's okay, listen, it's okay if it's too much for you. 
I think we've got to start there. I think we've got to admit that. I think if we don't admit that, we don't go to counseling. Do you know I go to counseling? You know it really helps? Do you know you're not less of a man or a woman or a husband or a wife or a Christian? If you say, I do need to talk to someone. I do need people around me. I can't do this by myself. The journey's too much for you. But the journey's not too much for him. I want you to look at the mercy and wisdom of our God. And Christians, I think we need to lead this way better, parent this way, be better friends. Because usually if a friend comes to you with a problem, we're like, we just got, you just need to pray about it. Some of us people don't need prayer. They need a pancake. You see God's wisdom here? I'm not saying prayer is not important. But do you see God's wisdom? Looking at him and knowing his needs and saying, okay, you need to sleep. Let's step away for a bit. We're going to rest. We're going to take care of our body. We're going to eat. We're going to drink. We're going to recover. God gave him time. Don't miss the wisdom and the grace of our God. But the ultimate thing he needed was this. This is point three. Because I want to address the question. What's this still small voice about? we got to trust his presence. Because Elijah needed all those things. But the ultimate thing he needed was God's presence. What is this rock about? God, Elijah's like under this rock, under this cave, and all these things, there's earthquake, there's wind, there's fire. What's this going on? Then there's a still small voice. What's going on? What, what is this? What is this? And how is this the climax? How is this the ultimate thing Elijah needs? I think there's two things. I'm leaning on Tim Keller here for a bit. Two things that I see in this. One, Elijah needed to learn the main way that God is going to work in your life is not going to be miracles and fire and huge flashy things. It's going to be through his word, through his presence. And if you're living a life asking for this big, flashy thing, can God do that? Absolutely. But the main way he's going to work in your life is through his word, through his voice, through his presence. The second thing I want you to see is that he needed the rock. I think the man who said, I don't need anybody. It's just me. I'm fine. He needed the rock. He needed the word. And in order for Elijah to get the word to stand in God's presence, he needed the rock. Because I don't know if you see this image, but these are all things of judgment. Even Elijah, even Elijah could not stand in the presence of God unless there was a mediator. Even him, even him, he is, he is still sinful. But what you got to see is the rock took the earthquake and was split. The rock shielded him, sheltered him, protected him from the wind, from the fire. The rock took the earthquake, it took the wind, it took the fire, so Elijah could stand in the presence of God. Friends, that's the gospel. The main thing we need, we need a rock. We need something, we need someone that will allow us to stand in the presence of God, to hear his voice, to know, to have his presence, to be saved, to be made whole, and that rock is Jesus Christ. You need pancakes, you need rest, you too, but the main thing you need is a relationship with God, and you need to know the gospel. Elijah, me, all of us, we are more sinful and flawed than we'd ever believe, but at the exact same time, we're more loved and accepted in him than we could ever dare hope. Jesus Christ took the judgment of God so you could stand in the presence of God. Jesus Christ was rocked, was split, was crushed so we could stand in the presence of a holy, perfect God. Jesus took the judgment. So we could stand in the presence of God. And I want to ask you as we close today and remind you, do you know it's not on you to save the world? Do you know it's not on you to have the perfect plan? Do you know it's not on you to have the perfect record of righteousness and impress God with it? Will you let him restore you? Will you let him make you new? Will you let him clothe you? Will you let him just wash you? Will you let him give you a plan for your life? Will you let him take your burdens off? Only he can do that. And Jesus allows us to stand in his presence. Whatever you're up against, whatever you're facing, whatever you're fighting, know this, you do not have to do this alone. He loves you. He has a plan for you. And it's greater than you could have ever asked or imagined. Would you pray with me?